So a couple of weeks back, I did an interview with the guys from Trigonometry, and I was very excited about this interview. It was one of the first ones where I've actually been able to use my professional expertise talking about the impact of what's going on in the world, on the world of work, and especially we broached my favorite topic of this white fragility training in the workplace, or you know, anti-racist training in the workplace, or implicit, implicit racial superiority training, whatever you want to call it. Any of these trainings that is based on Robin D. Angelo's white fragility and that whole train of critical theory, we talked about how that is grossly ineffective in the workplace. So I was very proud of this interview. I thought it was great. And I've, I've linked it in the description below. I hope you all take a minute to watch it. But what I found to be curious was that YouTube shadow banned it for several hours yesterday. You could not find the interview if you searched for it. I noticed it. The guys from Trigonometry noticed it. They actually have video evidence of it being shadow banned. And the situation is resolved. It's not shadow banned anymore. But when we discovered this, I definitely started thinking, like, why? Why is this particular interview? This is probably one of the I mean, and I don't actually think I do much controversial stuff, if I'm honest about it, but of all the things I've done, this was actually probably one of the least controversial things because we talked about things that are actually provable in real life, which is that there is no evidence that this anti-racist training does any good in the workplace at all. In fact, there is the opposite of that. There is evidence that this does not work, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But I think that the reason that YouTube shadow banned it is, listen, I'm probably pretty dangerous so far as YouTube is concerned because I am a reasonable person, or at least I try to be a reasonable person. I know my stuff. I've been doing this work for a long time. I'm speaking out on one of their favorite topics and calling them on the BS that they're spewing, and I'm doing it in a reasonable way where I have the experience and expertise to back it up. Can you imagine anything more dangerous? Oh, and P.S. I left the Democratic Party and I'm voting for Donald Trump. So I've like, I've got all the cards stacked against me so far as YouTube is concerned because I'm not an unreasonable person. I'm not someone that's, you know, spewing legitimate nonsense like like the 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 actual far right might spew. And I say that I struggle with those words because we all know that in the land of YouTube, I'm considered to be far right. And it's it boggles my mind. Anyway, that's a different topic for a different day. What I do want to show is that I am not the only person saying that this training is ridiculous and ineffective and harmful in organizations. This is actually a topic I legitimately care about. I, I spent years working towards a PhD in this and then building a business to do this because I legitimately care about people having positive experiences in the work environment. We spend our lives at work. There is absolutely no reason that it should be a miserable, painful experience. There's no reason for it. And furthermore, organizations are going to do better. Their bottom line is going to be better if their employees have positive experiences, if they're happy. It is like a win-win. And this type of anti-racist training when it's infused into organization, this is like, it is going to skewer teamwork. It is going to demolish psychological safety. All the things that actually drive high performing, resilient teams, this type of training is going to directly counteract. And I'm not the only one saying it. And I'm going to prove it by reading this article. But before we get into that, we have to have our usual housekeeping business. Guys, I'm trying to grow to the channel. I really, really, really want to get to 100,000 subs by election day. It's totally doable. I'm absolutely on track to do it and probably even be a little early at it if everything keeps going the way it is. But you can help me out if you like my content, you like what I'm doing. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel by subscribing for your first time, turning on those notifications, or by double checking to make sure that YouTube has not unsubscribed you yet. I really appreciate it. All right, let's dig into this article. Why diversity training on campus is likely to disappoint. Now this is focusing specifically on higher education, but it's going to get the point across quite well, I believe. U.S. colleges and universities will be embracing diversity training with renewed vigor this fall. In the response to the killing of George Floyd, the massive Black Lives Matter protests and pressure from students doesn't 
students ain't pressuring them. I'm, I, I worked in higher education for 10 years. Students ain't pressuring nothing. If, it, if they are, it is a small band of very loud students, but the majority of students probably do not care. Let's keep going. Dozens of colleges and universities have made public commitments to new anti-racism initiatives. The University of Florida, I actually know people at the University of Florida that are going to have to undergo this training, by the way, and they've already promised to get me those documents, so we'll have more on that soon. The University of Florida will require all students, faculty, and staff to undergo training on racism, inclusion, and bias. Northeastern University will institute cultural competency and anti-racist training for every member of the campus community. And Ohio Wesleyan University will mandate universal diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Now, it's really important to understand that when we're talking about these trainings being mandated at universities, you might just think that this is about indoctrinating students. And that's that's true and that's fair enough. But it's not just the students. It's every member of the faculty. And the biggest group is actually every member of the staff and the administration. And people sometimes dismiss the impact of indoctrinating the staff into these things. But university staffs are huge. There is oftentimes just more, I mean, significantly more members of the staff than there are the faculty. Then who do you think brings all those students in? They're all having to go through this training too. These are just everyday average people have already been through college or just out in the working world. Many of them, I'm sorry, I'm just going to say it. Many of them are like not the brightest crayons in the box. Some of them are super smart, but many of them are like not the brightest crayons in the box. They're just living their lives, man. They're just like average people. And they're being forced to go through this training. And it is a massive indoctrination of not just the youngest and most impressionable, but everyone. Given the vital importance of confronting past and present racism, we believe it is imperative that colleges and universities... However, scholars who study race and social inequality... However, as scholars who study race and social inequality, we know that diversity training suffers from chronically disappointing results. Huh. How about that? Scholars who study race and social inequality know that diversity training doesn't work. Recent research in psychology even suggests that diversity training may cause more problems than it solves. Huh, how about that? You you mean I'm not just screaming my head off about this to be difficult? You mean I actually know what the F I'm talking about? Let's keep going. What diversity training looks like. Called into a typical diversity training session, you may be told to complete a privilege walk. Step forward if you are a white male, backwards if your ancestors were forced to come to the United States, forward if either of your grandparents graduated from college, backwards if you grew up in an urban setting, and so on. You could be instructed to play culture bingo. In this game, you would earn points for knowing what melanin is, the influence Zoot Suits had on Chicano history, and your Chinese birth sign. You might be informed that white folks use white talk, which is task-oriented and intellectual, while people of color use color commentary, which is process-oriented and emotional. Oh my god, that is incredibly racist. <laughs> it's just, but, but of course we're not surprised by that because you guys have watched my other videos on white fragility and if you haven't yet, you really should. You will most definitely be encouraged to internalize an ever-expanding diversity lexicon. This vocabulary includes terms such as Latinx, microaggressions, and white privilege. It also features terms that are more obscure like adultism, which is defined as prejudiced thoughts and discriminatory actions against young people in favor of older. I, that's a new one to me. I had not heard that particular one. Okay. Apparently everyone is just discriminating against everyone. This is the world in which we live in, in 2020. Disappointing results and unintended consequences. The terms of reducing bias and promoting racial equality diversity training has failed spectacularly according to the expert assessment of sociologists, of sociologists. Guys, if sociologists are saying that this training does not work, sociologists, like, 
How much, like, I mean, soon gender studies people will be saying this training doesn't work. It'll be anarchy, dogs and cats living together. Oh my God. Uh, this is Frank Dobin and Alexandra Kalev. When Dobin and Kalev evaluated the diversity, the impact of, excuse me, when Dobin and Kalev evaluated the impact of diversity training at more than 800 companies... Over three decades, because this stuff has been around a lot longer than white fragility has, they found that the positive results or the positive effects are short lived and the compulsory training generates resistance and resentment. And I'll bet you what? I'll bet you with this like new brand of white fragility diversity training, I bet you that's going up. The, the resentment for having to do this, I bet you it's going to skyrocket and that's not good for anyone. A company is better off doing nothing than mandatory diversity training, Kalev con concluded. Again, this is a sociologist. This type of stuff, that's like the sociologist playground. And they're saying, listen, workplaces, you're better off doing nothing than mandatory diversity training. Some of the more, more popular training approaches are of dubious value. There is evidence, for example, that introducing people to the most commonly used readings about white privilege can reduce sympathy for poor whites, especially among social liberals. Who would have thunk it? It's like they, it's like there haven't been any of us screaming about this nonsense and saying that this was exactly what's going to happen. The research backs it up. There is also evidence that emphasizing cultural differences across racial groups can lead to an increased belief in fundamental biological differences among races. Well, there are fundamental bio biological differences among races, but you need to look at it. It's like it's not every person is impacted in the same way. It's like a bell curve, man. It's, it's the same thing as every other type of difference. That means that some people are not going to have them and some people are going to have them. It's just the way it is, or it's going to be like more extreme. Blah, blah, blah. That means that well-intentioned efforts to celebrate diversity may in fact reinforce racial stereotyping. I'll tell you this, when my friends became pod people and started spewing this nonsense, and as a reminder, if you haven't heard me say this, a lot of my friends came from higher education. They worked in higher education because I worked in higher ed for like 10 years. When they started spewing this nonsense, and I kind of started going along with it because I wanted to keep being their friend and didn't want to like rock the boat, I, I said to myself, like, you're getting, you're getting racist. Like, you're actually starting to be racist because you're around this nonsense and spewing this nonsense. And that made me incredibly uncomfortable. So I absolutely believe it. This means that well-intentioned efforts to celebrate diversity may, in fact, reinforce racial stereotyping. With its emphasis on do's and don'ts, diversity training tends to be little more than a form of etiquette. Huh. It spells out rules that are just as rigid as those that govern the placement of salad forks and soup spoons. The fear of saying the wrong thing often leads to unproductive, highly scripted conversations. Listen, man, I didn't highlight this part of white fragility in the videos I've done on it, but if you read the conversations that Robin D'Angelo is saying that she has with her black colleagues, no one talks like that. No one in the real world talks like Robin D'Angelo says she's talking in white fragility. It's just so scripted and so contrived and so inauthentic and lacks any sort of just like normal human interaction. This is the exact opposite of the kinds of debates and discussions that you would hope to find on a college campus. The main beneficiaries of the forthcoming explosion in diversity programming will be the swelling ranks of diversity and inclusion consultants who stand to make a pretty penny. A one-day training session for around 50 people costs anywhere between $2,000 and $6,000. They've got those numbers low. D'Angelo, the best-selling author of White Fragility, charges up to $15,000 per event. Listen, I do corporate training. You can charge significantly more than $2,000 to $6,000 for a one-day training session. One-day training from me starts at $12,500.
That's what it starts at. Now, that's not without flexibility. I do special rates for nonprofits or for smaller organizations that I truly believe don't have the resources, but a one-day training session is a lot of work to put together. It's expensive to put together. It's time-consuming to put together. It's time-consuming to execute. You should, well, back in the day, I used to have to travel to do it as well. You like $2,000 to $6,000 for a one-day of training is on the low. It is not, that's not that much. And again, Robin D'Angelo saying she charges up to $15,000 per event. That's only true in the case that Robin D'Angelo has a really, 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 really crappy agent. Honestly, Robin D'Angelo should be charging a minimum of $25,000 to $30,000 per event, and I think that number is low. There are absolutely people who charge significantly more than her. I mean, I know conference keynotes from people that have much less notoriety than Robin D'Angelo does right now are like $50,000. So th these numbers are low. They're raking it in. In this belt tightening era of COVID-19, should colleges and universities really be spending precarious dollars on measures that have been proven to fail? No, no, they shouldn't. Thank you. Alternatives to training. In our view, instead of pouring money into diversity training, colleges and universities would be better off using their limited resources to provide increased financial aid and better academic support systems for underrepresented students. I completely agree with that. The increasing number of scholarships and fellowships that have been established in George Floyd's name are a welcome step in this direction. So there was a trend that started, I want to say about 15 years ago, and I don't know if it's continuing today because my head it has not been in the world of higher education for a while, but this definitely started about 15 years ago of colleges and universities directing in, or investing in positions like director of student success, things like that, to make sure that students, all students, all students had the support that they needed to succeed in college um, so that they, they could get them through school in four years without having to, you know, drop out or, you know, take another uh, fifth year or any sort of thing. There was a big push for that sort of stuff. I don't know if that's still going on, but I absolutely believe that that is a much better investment than this diversity training. Actually put systems in place that are going to support students. But P.S. I'm going to say this. I've worked in admissions offices in higher education. I've worked in marketing offices in higher education. I've worked in development offices for higher education. They are spending a metric fuck ton of money on marketing to recruit new students. This is true at the vast majority of colleges. The vast majority of colleges in this country are not well known, like big name, uh, exclusive admissions colleges. They're just not. The vast majority of colleges in this country actually have very high acceptance rates and they hide it. They do things like, you know what they do to get their acceptance rate down when they go into the college admissions material is they, um, if, if you say, like if you are a 16 or 17 year old student that fills out like an online application, but then you decide, oh, I don't really want to go to that school and you never send your transcripts or any of the supporting documents for the application, they reject you. It's called an administrative rejection. And they use all those administrative rejections to push down their acceptance rates to make it look like they're more exclusive than they actually are. But at the vast majority of colleges, most students will get accepted in some way. I mean, I'm talking like over 90%. And they're doing this because the, the market for recruiting new students, I mean, that is their money. That is their tuition revenue is getting these new students in. It's how they pay for everything. And there is fierce competition among most colleges to recruit those students so they can actually meet their numbers. So they're spending a metric fuck ton of money on marketing. It is, I mean... It would blow your mind how many, how many tuition dollars go towards marketing exclusively and not go towards systems that can support the student experience, create a better student experience, make sure they're successful, provide them with resources, all that stuff. Let's keep going. We also recommend that schools invest more in expanding the full range of educational opportunities at their disposal to better understand and disrupt systemic racism. Okay, I don't really think that that means anything, but whatever. This includes core. Oh, oh, holy crap. This might, guys, guys, this might actually be the first article that advances the notion of disrupting systemic racism that actually provides insight on what you can do to do that. Like, my mind is blown. I wasn't expecting that. 
This includes coursework, lecture series, discussion panels, student speakouts, college-wide teach-ins, exhibitions, performances, and common readings. I don't think, hang on, none of these things are, I take that back. None of these things are actually gonna disrupt systemic racism. Educating people about it is not disrupting systemic racism. It's educating them about the system that exists. And, and I'm kind of making a qualifier there that, you know, I'm making the assumption that systemic racism and they are defining it is a real thing. I don't know exactly how they're defining it, so I can't say for sure if it's actually a real thing, but let's just, let's just play pretend for a second. Don't call me on the comments. I'm qualifying this. Such an approach would enable universities to use the extensive knowledge and expertise that their faculty, students, and staff already have on the issues of race and inequality. No, the staff should be focused on supporting the students. Wrong answer, sociologists. It would be far better than relying on the kind of mass-produced drive-through diversity training provided by outside experts. I mean, I think we can find some agreement there. I do actually think that their option would be more productive. Do I think it would be effective? No. Campus communities don't need diversity consultants to lead workshops about terms such as microaggressions, micro micro invalidations, and micro insults. Oh good, we have all sorts of micro popping up now. Instead, they should discuss the thought-provoking works such as poet Claudia Rankine's book, Citizen, a personal account that strips bare the everyday realities of racism. Why is there like a ad in the middle of this article for a book? Rather than simply declaring that illegal immigrant is an unacceptable derogatory term, analyze Jason De Leon's The Land of Open Graves, a vivid portrait that pushes our understanding of how lives are lived and lost in the U.S.-Mexican border to a new level. I mean, that's like actually a fair point. To explain the concept of intersectionality, ugh. Replace social identity wheel exercises with an examination of the 1977 Kambahi River Collective Statement, whose black feminist authors insisted that it was not possible to separate race from class from sex oppression. Facing urgent calls for actions, colleges and universities have embraced diversity tra training to try to prove that they really are doing something to advance racial injustice, but the relevant evidence suggests that offering ineffective superficial remedies to the complex problems of prejudice and exclusion, diversity training will short change campus communities and short circuit critical thinking. If colleges and universities want to affect meaningful social change, they will soon discover that diversity training is no substitute for education. So listen, these, this is an article written by, we've got an associate professor of history, we've got an associate professor of educational studies, people who are like self-professed to be part of this community saying this training doesn't work. It doesn't work. It does not get results. There is no evidence that it gets results. Listen, if you have evidence that these types of trainings are actually effective, please send it to me. Honestly, I would love to see it. I would love to see some basis for organizations spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on this insanity. If there is a basis for it, if you can show it's effective, I will admit I'm wrong. I will do a massive mea culpa. I just don't think that evidence exists, but I dare you to prove me wrong. All right, guys, that's all I've got for this one. I'll see you soon.